Welcome to another episode of the Carry Trainer Higher Line Podcast. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Higher Line Podcast. We've got a special guest and it's a timely, timely uh, discussion today. It's Catalina and you're running for the 14th Congressional District. Yeah. So you're running for Congress. You're yeah. like you're like 16 years old. Yeah. No. How old are you? 26. 26. Yeah. Close enough. On a good day. <laughs> On a good day. You're 26. You're running for Congress. Most of the time, people interview her. They want to talk all serious. So she's going to have to fight the urge to <laughs> to not be serious because she's running for an important office. But talk about it for a minute before we like dig in. What makes a 26-year-old girl? Most of your friends are probably in college, starting families chasing their their careers which this is a career but yeah what, watching the bachelor yeah uh, what, what makes it what makes you want to go to congress honestly aoc and the squad have completely transformed politics so really quick just when we're acronyms and things like that yeah just say the whole name okay so alexander ocasio cortez okay. Uh, you know, this is a district that President Trump won by four points. And Lauren Underwood came in and really just disrupted the system here, uh, took over the seat. She campaigned as a moderate, but very quickly became a squad member, an mm -hmm. honorary squad member. And I've seen just the rise of these women, not only from a far left socialist type of policy perspective, but also in rhetoric and how damaging that is for the future. And I think it's time that we have more people on the conservative movement, on the side of freedom, younger faces and new perspectives to really combat and counter voice what these women are trying to do you know, in politics today. What if, and I'm going to throw some hard, not hard, but I, I like great. I like to be devil's advocate, but I also don't like to toe the line. I have this philosophy, and it pisses people off, that those women are doing exactly what they think is right. Like, I don't believe that there's some, like, hooded figure somewhere, like, puppet mastering these, these women or men. Yeah. Like, I think that they literally feel their policies, their ideas are what's best for humanity. Well, I would disagree because maybe somebody like Lauren Underwood who plays into that. She was an Obama appointee, so she's obviously had some sort of... She's been part of the swamp, right? But somebody like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who auditioned for her role and was backed substantially fi financially by these hooded figures, I don't believe does... Truly believe. I think she is in it for the power game okay. and knows how to manipulate the masses. So are you saying you think that, and I, and I can't, I'm not going to assume that you'll think for her, but if somebody 50% the other way yeah. or 180 degrees was backing her, you think she'd be pro-gun and, and pro-life and all of these things? I've found that the Republican Party does not have this type of support or, you know, I've just seen it in this primary where sometimes people think that I am like cooked in a lab and it's like, no, I'm a real American person that loves this country mm -hmm. and wants to fight for it. Whereas AOC is blatantly has been supported by these powers that be in her party, but we don't have that type of organization or this, when this you say underground you're network, about, you're the talking Republican about Party. Republican right. and conservatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're everyday people. And that's the way politics should be. I don't think that you should be cooked in a lab and uh, just told what to say and given all the financial backing to run a campaign. You know, our founders wanted people who were going to be everyday Americans to represent us. And right now, politics, especially in the far left, I mean, they're very good at organizing, clearing primaries, making sure that they have the right candidate to go up against incumbents and a lot of the times Republican incumbents, mm -hmm. or even what AOC did. She dismantled a very powerful establishment Democrat. So they know what they're doing. They have an, org an organization and a, a body of people who are supporting candidates like that. Whereas Republicans, we're just, we're catching up and we're everyday people. So I got to jump in here because having been a vice chairman of that party, I got to say there's some fake ass sons of bitches that wear that moniker as well. Yeah. Um, and I can say that you can't, well, maybe you can, but, uh, 
I think that's the problem is that people have to, they feel like they need to pretend because they don't want them, the voter yeah. or, or the, the, the donor or whoever to judge them. Yeah. And it's like our problem because we do judge. Oh, she's only 26. Right. Or uh, did you go to school? I did. What did you study? Political science and communications. Okay. So like somebody could say, well, she has no life experience. I know yeah. at 26, I had some life experience, but I probably wasn't fit to do things I'm doing now. And sure. I'm not comparing me <laughs> to you, but people do this. We make these, these, yeah, these assumptions, but sometimes they're valid, right? Like, like you saw my little dog when you got here and you're like, oh, she's cute. If that dog was 180 pounds and was like growling with drool, yeah. you'd probably be like, I don't want to go by your dog. Could you lock the dog up? Because you, I probably you, still would go by the dog. Would you? Yeah. Okay, but a normal person <laughs> no, that would, would automatically assume based on what they see, they'd make an assumption sure. or a judgment that like that animal wants to hurt me. Well, I think a lot of it too is just the era of politics that we're in today. There's so much more transparency when you look at Twitter and the digital era and news. You know, nobody wants this. Uh, suited up politician anymore, like the Mitt Romneys of the world. Nobody wants, in, in my race here, you know, like a Jim Oberweiss. I mean, that type of politician that just lives in the ivory tower, is wearing a suit. Um, I like suits. What's wrong with a suit? I mean, an empty suit. You're not an empty suit, and that's but, but what I'm, I'm talking saying, but, about. But, but, like, is it, the, is it the suit or is it the substance? No, it's the, su it's the inauthenticity mm -hmm. of it. It's that they're these button-up people, and you know, today I was at a rally with a bunch of farmers wearing my flannel, and it's like this is what. Now wait a second. This Did you what? put a flannel on because you were going to see farmers? No, or did you put a flannel on because you wear flannels. Because I because I wear flannels. You didn't wear a flannel a here. Now you got kind of a suit coat on. <laughs> I have an event later. <laughs> I'm going to a different part of the district. I know. I'm just the playing district. with you. No, but I think it comes down to people want more authenticity, and that's in a lot of ways why AOC and the squad and these women really gravitate towards their base, and especially millennials, because we want everyday people who you know AOC does these you know her little kitchen sink uh videos i haven't seen one what what is the context it's just, it's just her talking to the camera on okay. her phone and but it seems so real right and we have never seen that in our politics until today uh and a lot of that has to do with the digital era and so it's like in a it's a good thing because people all, can be more authentic and people can have more transparency. I really love Dan Crenshaw posts videos all the time on mm -hmm. why he's voted on different policies. Yeah. Why he so he looks he's an everyday American, but he's also explaining what his role is on a policy perspective and being able to message that to his constituents. For a long time, we didn't have that. We had these empty suits Everything going to was Washington. Filtered. It was filtered. They used these little talking points. We still have that. Sure. But politics is changing in a good way. You know, that is in a lot of ways how the founders did intend it. Yeah. They, I, I talk about this with folks, the discord. There's this fallacy that that you, you noticed the uh, Federalist Papers on the bookshelf. There's this fallacy that, that at that time in 17... 70 yeah. these men were sitting around and they're like cheerio and and <laughs> having like a good time they screamed and yelled at each other i'm sure there were some quills getting whipped guys had duels right and, and i'm not that's not what you're getting at but they were uh they were raw and then you read things like uh, uh why we sit here idly while they're out in the field dying right. you know it, it like impassioned speeches mm -hmm. and now it's there's definitely some impassioned speeches, but most of it seems to have been um, crafted for the media. For the, you talk, We're talking on your way in about being on news outlets where it's just, let me get the sound bite, and you don't really get to have a conversation. You get 30 seconds to go. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and it's changing. It's like... In Podcasts like these are mm -hmm. a great way, especially when you're talking about politics, because you can get deeper and you can learn who the candidate is and really get an idea of who they are outside of just being a politician. Right? Who are you? Oh, we can get to that later. No, not, this is, okay, this no is, I wanted to make a point, though, boss. of, you know, I just being on the campaign trail, there's such a, you know, even stopping into restaurants or diners and just trying to get out there and campaign. Mm -hmm. 
There is such a, a negative connotation when it comes to politicians. Sure. And that's wrong because this is why people are not held accountable. This is why you ha- you're seeing low voter turnout in constant elections other than 2016 with President Trump. And I think even in 2020, somebody like President Trump will get a lot of voter turnout. But we're seeing this culture of, of distrust in politicians. And that's so wrong. You know, we, we should take away that film and say, look, I'm an everyday person and I want to represent you because I care and because I could be the vo- voice of a district. So I mean, it's pretty easy to have that lack of respect when so often uh, our home state, our yeah. worst, one of the worst financial uh, uh, states in the country, uh governors in prison uh it seems like once a week somebody is getting indicted Mm -hmm. and it's so eventually you just just don't care and you don't believe it so when somebody like yourself stands up and they say hey i'm going to do this for all the right reasons people go that's what bob said and bob's in prison that's what sally said (laughs) and sally's under indictment that's what john said and john's you know two months in stop doing the things he said he was going to do or she was going to do. That's that's true, but I hope to prove them all wrong. So, who do you owe? No one. No one? I'm proud to say that in this primary, so I'm in a, in a big primary, and a lot of the candidates have just written themselves checks, right? A gentleman wrote himself a million-dollar check the other day. They've all given themselves... Nothing wrong with that. No, there's not, but I will say... I'm the only candidate in the primary that I outraised my opponents two to one on small dollar contributions from the district. That's cool. So that's five dollars from different areas of the district, whether it's the agricultural community down to the suburbs. And mm-hmm. you know, it, it's I have contributions from every part of the district. Yeah. And there's power in that. We've got a pretty unique district here because most of our state, as I'm stuttering, is either are all rural or completely urban yeah and we're one of the few that's one of the few districts that's got like dairy farms and and big old school farming as well as fairly good sized communities in it which is what makes it so unique too and what's great is when you you know i grew up down the street from here next Mm -hmm. to cornfields and um but you know i've spent some time in the city and i think that's what makes politicians but people from the the heartland in the midwest so unique especially when you go to washington because you can understand different challenges from everybody Mm -hmm. in a district and but even look at you know we have abraham lincoln and ronald reagan you know people that have really been able to um capture so many different people and i had an interesting conversation this morning at this rally with farmers was you know his concern was well, how do we keep these districts from changing all blue as they become more urban and, and you know, the Democrats are really in- infiltrating a lot of these exurbs? And I said, well, and on top of that, a lot of these districts are changing demographically. I mean, we're, we're seeing higher number of Hispanics and minority community. Um, you know, millennials are, are really taking over this district as well. Mm-hmm. And this is a reason why we need new candidates that can appeal to a broader base. Lauren Underwood didn't just win because it was a blue wave and there was low voter turnout on the Republican side. She won because she was a young minority female and millennial. And she was able to grab a a different set of electorate votes that traditionally Republicans just couldn't get. And we need new people on the side of freedom and on the conservative side that can also appeal to a broader base of people. What does freedom mean to you? Gosh, our our liberty, um, not being not being afraid to talk about what our values are. I mean, look at what's happening when in 2016 when people were whispering uh, about supporting President Trump, mm-hmm. or what you're seeing now with the far left who attacks people for being patriotic. Uh, that is Give me an a example. direct you t- attack. You t- you're talking about, are you talking about if kneeling at the, the the football game? And- that, or even what's happening on college campuses. I mean, you have these, God, the, uh, here in, in our district, at McHenry County College, 
uh, the Turning Point USA kids were trying to put together a keynote speaker. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, I mean, these kids were, the Democrats came in and tried to protest him and try to rip down the signs and, and try to incite violence. Well, that's not freedom. Sure. We need to ensure that we're protecting our individual liberties. We're protecting our rights. Is that government's job to do that? In that in that in that capacity, like you know, the kids getting impassioned about what they believe in at a college campus is that government's job. I'm just just digging here. It's government's job to respect our freedoms, sure. right? And the biggest problem is the culture war. And when government plays into the culture war, that's the problem. Bingo. Okay. So, so this cultural shift, yeah. I mean, it, it, I, I talk about this constantly on this podcast. People talk about a change in culture. Yeah. A uh, hundred and two years ago, mm -hmm. you couldn't vote, let alone run for Congress yeah. purely because of the way you were designed. Right. Uh, 160 years ago, we still had people enslaved. There's still places in this country that to be homosexual is technically a crime. Yeah. So, like, the advance of certain ideas is pretty darn cool, but, like, who draws the lines, you know? And I'm, I'm on the same page, but it is a cultural issue. Those kids at the college campus, uh, I always took our kids to... Uh, Memorial Day parades, Fourth of July parades, and it wasn't just to collect candy. We'd go to the parade and talk about why we're having this this parade or uh, uh, President's Day coming up or Veterans Day and things like that. Yeah. Understanding the context behind it, our parents aren't passing that stuff on. Well, because it's been, you know, this American exceptionalism has been so tainted by the far left. And, I mean, think about when we're talking about the border mm -hmm. or we're talking about Lauren Underwood, for example, calls Republicans racist and sexist. I mean, this is not, that doesn't help a country. You know, what brings us together? She is actually this said fact. that. Yeah, she did. She, she like, the, uh, I'm not discounting that, but she said Republicans are racist and sexist. Or did yes. she say, like, some Republicans are? No, she said Republicans are racist and sexist. Pretty heavy duty. And... That should not be coming out of the mouth of an elected official because you represent everybody, Republicans and Democrats. And to play into this that we're racist and sexist, I mean, that is the culture war. They try to pit us against each other. And we need to remember what makes us all, um, what unites us is the fact that we are all Americans, that sure. we do have our flag and, and our founding and the values of that. And we need to preserve that as much as possible. Because what's happening right now is not, it is a direct attack on, on everything that we stand for as a country and everything that binds us together as Americans. So what are you going to do about it? <laughs> I'm going to fight back. How do you do that, though? I mean, you know, we, it, the way most legislators, people say lawmakers, I like to say representatives because I never elect anybody to go make laws. I, <laughs> yeah. I elect them to represent me. Most of the way they do that is by enacting law, you can do this, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. How can you, what will you do to help change that on a cultural level rather than just, because the cool thing about being a congressperson or a senator or, or um, uh, you know, another elected official is that you have some sway over, over people, not just from a legislative position, but... As the dog... <laughs> she wants Charlie, some love here. Charlie likes her. Um, that's a great question. You know, I think. Hi. Now we're so, pandering to the dog lovers. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a so it, it is. So a big, and again, this is why I think we need younger people in office because a big difference between myself and an oppo and any opponent here in the primary I'm not playing on my phone I'm going to look that, something up so keep going is that we have you know the power of voice millennials have the power of voice we want to speak with conviction we're not afraid to put ourselves out there and, and really speak our minds and a big way to do that is now utilizing social media and 
having a platform to talk about your policies. That's something that representatives didn't have 20, 30 years ago. Uh, you had newspapers. You had, you know, you, you were forced to have um, not as much, there wasn't enough transparency because there just wasn't a platform for it. Mm -hmm. But now we have the ability to talk about our values at a mass scale and and there's a lot of value in that. That does add transparency and accountability. And you know, Eos, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez <laughs> um, dominates a policy narrative because of her Twitter. You know, she has more power, arguably. Rap rapid flow of information. Right. She has more power, arguably, than somebody like Nancy Pelosi, who's sure. Speaker of the House. Sure. Because she has that platform and access to an audience. We need more of that, but on the side of conservative values. And we don't have enough people fighting for what we believe in. I uh, have built a business using social media. Yeah. And you don't have to at all use the, the old ways of doing things. I'm, I pulled up a list of the age of some of the founders. Yeah. This is, this is pro you. <laughs> Fifteen? <laughs> no, but uh, Andrew Jackson was nine when the declaration yeah. was signed. Uh, but just going to some other ones. Uh, there's a lot of men here. Aaron Burr was 20. John Marshall. Anybody that studied law knows who John Marshall is. Was 20. Alexander Hamilton, who was a, one of the, the greats, was 21. Many of these guys were in their early 20s. James Madison, the James Madison, was 25. Henry Knox, 25. Yeah. John Paul Jones, 28. And uh, these, these people that are your age and without arguably any one of them, because they all did so much, the Republic would have never existed. So I think anybody that would, would um, use your age as a reason... Uh, to not support you is short-sighted so well thank you yeah. but you also think about you know these people had so much more at stake than anything I'll ever have to risk I mean these people were I disagree fighting for something I disagree <laughs> I disagree because and I don't mean to cut you off Drew and I have seen it. People will ruin you. Yeah. Ruin you. Yes, you're not going to get hung at the gallows, right. which none well, of them were. But you're not. You're not. You're risking your uh, online these days. You can be ruined forever yeah. by something. And that. I mean, that's that's one reason so many people don't get involved in politics. I know lots of. We know people together that are could be great leaders. Uh, for their community, but they don't want to deal with the fact that uh, in college they like to do beer bongs and somebody took a Polaroid of it, and yeah. they, it which is, it, it's mind-numbing. Yeah. But. The public backlash is tough, I will say. I mean, luckily, that's how I know I'm on a good route to win this primary because I already have Democrats trolling me all the time. And it's not fun, but... You know, you if you don't believe in something, you'll fall for anything. You know, I've always tried to live my life that way. And the less... They want to silence us. You yeah. know, the other side wants you to be silenced. And they don't want good people to stand up and run uh, because of everything that happens. But what you need to take that plunge. What if everybody think, thought like you, think like you? What if everybody thought like you? What would the world be? I mean, we don't no we way. need that. Yeah. Don't we need that discourse? Don't you have to have? Like, you can't no. taste sweet without bitter. That's I'm fine with discourse as long as it's productive. But these character attacks mm -hmm. on different candidates and the way that social media sometimes really um, brings out the worst in people, sure. that's yeah, wrong. That's horrible. Because people aren't even listening to each other anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at this divide that we have right now uh, in the country. You know, people shouldn't be losing friends or... You know, losing family members over politics. Right. We need to focus on what unites us, but also doing it in a polite way. You want to have a good conversation, fine, but do it in a respectful way and listen to each other. Don't, I mean, God, the things that some trolls say is, is just ridiculous, but. Give us an example. 
Uh, I think I had somebody recently say I shouldn't procreate because I'm too concerned. I'm too like as Republican. In, as in, you would like you'd make a baby and then ruin this child. No, I, that I would. My offspring would would be. You know, the country like is another, worse, another a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I got you. I got you. God, but I mean, the worst things, especially as, you know, I will say that there's definitely a stigma against, and I've never been somebody to play into this feminism and ultra feminist culture, but the things that people have said, particularly because I'm young and um, a, a woman mm-hmm. and being a female running in this, you know, type of environment is pretty, pretty nasty. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. I can imagine. But bring it on. I mean, I don't care. Yeah. But. How do your parents feel about that? That's got to be hard. I would have a hard time seeing people, you know, if somebody is bullying my daughter, I don't. I wouldn't like that at all. Yeah. They. I just tell them, don't read it. Don't, don't read, read it. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fair. How do you feel about things like the Second Amendment? What's your thoughts there? Very strong on the Second Amendment. I grew up in a household where... You know, you don't touch the Harley, you don't touch the AR-15. And Mm -hmm. I wish government kind of had that idea because look at what's happening in Virginia and look at what's happening across the country. I mean, we live in a state that is very tough on guns and it is arguably our most important right. And we need to preserve it so much. And any time that they try to chip away at it, it's one thing more against our right Mm -hmm. and it's so important that we understand why we had it why the founders put it in there and why it's so important to keep it and i hate this idea that oh well what about assault weapons and magazines and things like that well first of all nobody can even define what an assault weapon is nobody can tell us um how is it the gun and not the person the focus needs to be on the mental health issue whenever a tragedy happens and but it's become so politicized that we're losing on the gun debate and we shouldn't be losing on it because it is our right and it should not be infringed upon. Why are we going on defense all the time? Well, because when somebody's constantly punching you in the head, you've got to block. Mm-hmm. And that's, yeah, we've got poor leadership in that. As a, as a congresswoman, what would you do in Washington to help uh, not only be offensive but yeah what what kind of initiatives would you take part in uh what you know talk about that a little bit well so there are already so many pieces of legislation out there that are um pretty entrenched already you look at you know background checks things like that well you know what can i help with is making sure that we don't have any more legislation that's coming out that's infringing upon our second amendment there's a ton in there mm-hmm. and the way that they do it too it's very sneaky there was a woman uh, against violence reauthorization act that had a lot of you know pro women policies but in that was the boyfriend loophole that didn't allow for due process you could yeah. report somebody and and you know this you're talking about red flag red laws. Lo- red flag laws yeah. without due process and you know Making sure that, because a lot of Republicans supported that bill, even if they're strong Second Amendment supporters. And it's making sure that we're combating that narrative and Mm -hmm. standing firm and saying, no, this is why I don't support this type of legislation. Uh, Being able to communicate it better in a way that Republicans have not been able to do it is what I hope to do. And, and also fight against that type of legislation and make sure that I have a voice and a powerful voice to counter it. Um, to deregulating a lot of these um, gun control type of measures. And, and I don't know exactly what's out there right now in the House, but taking a broader look and making sure that we're not allowing that type of legislation to pass, which is why we need a new Congress. So we're sure. not allowing the sure. Democrats Agreed. to control that. Would you use your position at all to help here at home? And we've got uh, our, of course, you can't create or enact law here in Illinois, but you still have sway. Would you Would you use your position here at all? Absolutely. Yeah. How, how so? Absolutely. Gosh, well, again, using a platform for for that type of, you know, to fight back against that at the state level, absolutely. But putting pressure on different, you know, Republicans that have supported red flag laws, two of them actually in my primary right now at the mm-hmm. state house, uh, making sure that we're not caving on this and 
leading and being a leader in this in this uh, conversation is absolutely something I would do. Unfortunately, Chicago beats us in a lot of this stuff as yeah. well. Yeah. But we have voice and we have control over it. Okay. I dig it. I like it. You got a favorite president? If I say Trump, is that... No, is it? Well, I don't mean it, in, no. in, in the totality of history. Well, yeah, of course. Well, you know, Reagan is everybody, every Republican's, um, you know, beacon of or example of hope, but... I'm a Teddy Roosevelt guy. Are you? So, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I would say that moving forward, you know, somebody like President Trump is a very good leader for this this era that we're in. And I really like what he's doing, not only on a policy perspective, but also on a leadership perspective. I mean, he's standing firm uh, and making sure that America and Americans are put first. And uh, in a lot of ways, Ronald Reagan, you know, was one of those. And, and taking on that America first type of agenda is what we need. Sure. And, and I hope to to be an example of that in the future, too. Do you, I, of course, you're super hyper-focused right now on winning. Yeah. Do you have aspirations to go beyond Congress? Do you I don't have, know. You don't know? If, you know, if, if I hope to serve and to be a good servant leader here that um, if there's support and there's a need for me on a different, on a broader scale, you know, I, I would I would do that. But um, I'm so focused on serving here now and, and on upon winning this. And I also believe in term limits, though. So yeah. maybe there's a chance, an opportunity for something greater. Talk but. about the term limits real quick. How many terms... Do you think a, a, a Congress person should do? I think three terms three? is enough. Yeah, I mean, when you have people on both sides of the aisle sitting in there for 30 years, yeah. I mean, that's just disgusting to me. There should be nothing career about We the people, though, we right. the people continue to elect those people. I know. Yeah. Yeah, well, we, got, we have to pay attention more. We need to have more involvement. I agree. It's not fun. You know, I have this... It's a very simple theory that we have the exact life that we're supposed to based on whatever it is that we we put out there and yeah most people are more in content to go home have a meal watch tv go to bed than they are to go to a meeting like yours and find out how helping a young person become congresswoman might affect their community or their country you know? yeah mm. Well, Boring. and again, I think it's a testament to the era, too, where the policies that are coming from the left are so far left that finally people are starting to wake up. And you have a lot of Democrats, record number of Democrats now that are voting Republican or independents. Yeah. And it's a uniting message now. It is truly freedom versus this dystopia that these people want to create. I mean, yeah. Bernie Sanders, a literal communist, could become the president of the United States next election. Yeah, he won't. No, but I'm not saying that like like as like a like. No, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It might not. No, Let's say it won't. How much up you got on you? No, well. <laughs> <laughs> but my point in saying that is that that is the world that they're living in, yeah. and I think that forces a lot of people to finally wake up and say no, this is not the world that I want to live in, so now I'm actually going to get involved. Sure. But the fact that it's taken us that long uh, to come around, and you even you know, put it back to this district where a lot of people didn't come out for the last uh, Republican who held the seat, and mm -hmm. that's why he mm -hmm. lost it. Mm -hmm. And it was because there wasn't enough energy. But now I can tell you there's so much energy now because people want to take this seat back so badly. Yeah. And they're even in a primary, they're actually so much more excited and more informed now that they want the best candidate up against Lauren Underwood because we have seen just the detriment of what her policies and her rhetoric rhetoric has have done. Tell us about a few of her policies that you would work to affect change in. Well, I'll just give you an example. So she's very much for uh, you know universal type of health care mm -hmm. in the in the medical system. She ran on a health care reformist type of message that a lot of people in this district wanted. And there needs to be reform, absolutely. But her idea of government reform healthcare reform is to add more government mm -hmm. and we need to ensure that it is in a free market free enterprise approach that is just 
not even on the table right now. I mean, they want Medicare for all, the Democrats. Uh, but one in particular, too, she recently was on the House floor with Representative Mark Green. And Representative Mark Green was talking about how veterans should have access to electronic medical records, EMRs. And she comes up on the House floor and says, well, why can't we uh, walk and chew gum at the same time, give EMRs to our veteran community, but also to illegal immigrants? Hmm. And that type of, and that wasn't the exact quote, but it, there's a clip of that on C-SPAN. That type of just backwards policy that we don't even, we're not even helping our own veterans in this community. Um, Illinois 14 has a large veteran community and she doesn't even want to help them over, she'd rather help illegal immigrants than putting our heroes, not only heroes, but her constituents uh, before. I mean, that's just not, that's not what a representative should be doing. You should be listening to your constituents and doing what's right by the people under their interests, not politicizing everything. So those are just to name a few. It's heavy. Yeah. Let's say you win, which yeah. I think you will. Let's say you win. Do you, you want to bet now? Or? <laughs> no, no, I was betting on, I was not betting on you, I, know, I was I'm betting kidding. on Sanders. Uh, uh, not, to, not to sound snarky, uh, he doesn't look a president. He's no, not going to win. I mean, there's so much of that is involved in it. Not. Uh, I will be an older man at some point, so I'm not picking on his f- physique or looks, but he won't be elected just on that alone. I hope he wins the nomination because then Trump will truly steamroll him. Yeah, but, but yeah what were for you sure. Say? So you win. Yeah. You go to Congress, you get your office, you got all your staffers, you're cranking, steak dinners, flying around. Yeah. You finish. You decide, okay, I did my three terms, I'm going on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. And, and somebody sits down and they, they say, okay, let's see what this gal did and let's put it all down. What, what will you be remembered for? If somebody looks back and says, okay, 26-year-old female congresswoman, what will they remember you for? Aside from good policy and being a champion for conservative values, whether that's free market and Mm -hmm. putting America first, putting my constituents first. I hope that I'm most remembered for um, being a servant leader and bridging the divide that's happening right now. And, you know, I think the biggest problem that we're seeing right now, especially for the young women and millennials um, who are currently in Congress is the shouting and the fighting and we need to remember that united we stand divided we fall and if i can ensure that the future is brighter after my term in congress not only for the district but for the country and i played into helping that divide and making um, the american dream possible and preserving that for generations to come then i know that i've done my job i dig it i dig it you you, a moment ago, I said, who are you? Yeah. And you said, we'll get to that. <laughs> well, who, who are you? Who are people, who are the people of this district going to elect? A patriot. So back at, back in 1774, 75, they're yeah. sitting around. <laughs> you wouldn't have had a seat at the table, but there were many women there that if not for them, it, it wouldn't have went down. You fancy you would have traded your neck for the the cause of the republic. One hundred and fifty percent. Absolutely. Knowing what you knew only based then, or knowing what you know now based on the light of history. Then and now, yeah. and I would still trade my neck for it because we live in the greatest country in the world. And if we don't have more people with that spirit and the fight and the drive to preserve what we have, then our country is lost. And Agreed. our founders foresaw something that um, was so incredibly powerful, the, the idea and the experiment that is America. Mm-hmm. And they have it. They're, they in they wanted to make sure that it would be something that generations upon generations could preserve. Yeah. And I want to make sure that we are preserving it. So who are you? <laughs> Catalina Lau, running in the 14th district. You like horseback riding? No. You like, uh, you know, what? You know, I'm just, I mean, growing up around here, I'm just an everyday girl. I mean. Do you drink beer? Yeah. 
Love. Bottles, cans, draft. Uh, okay, draft a little bit. I'm, okay. I'm a Pilsner girl. Pilsner girl. Yeah. Okay, so no Czech IPA. Pilsner. Wine. Not a big IPA. Love wine. Uh, in a former life, I had my level one for uh, wine education. Very cool. That makes sense. So love wine. Yeah. Reds, whites. Red. Total cab girl. Cab girl. French reds, okay. particularly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Truck or car? Truck. Ford or Chevy? Ford. Oh, all right. <laughs> all right. All right. Uh, let's see. What else? What else? Drew, what am I forgetting? We've already covered trucks and beer. What do our listeners want to know about a potential... If you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a hard one. That's a good one, yeah. If you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be? Where did the hell did you get that, Drew? Is that a thing, or did you just make that up? Uh, I don't know, probably from, like, the Two Ferns show or something. Oh. <laughs> Is that still around? I'm God, not that sure. was a great one. That was probably funny. not. That was funny. Do you got a boyfriend? A you got, is there a, no. uh, a Mrs. Uh, um, Mr. Almost Congress, Mr.? No. Nope. I know what that sounds like. No? Yeah, no. No, I'm, I, it, I'm just so busy right now. It's so hard. And it's also, I mean, it's a big, uh, when you talk about, you know, public scrutiny and just putting your life out there and all mm -hmm. that, I mean, it's, it's a big, when, you know, if and when I win, I mean, it, this is a life that is very difficult for anybody to understand. And I would want to make sure that, you know, whoever I, you know, choose to be with is not only very supportive, but um, secure in, in their own career yeah. and, and wanting to be a part of all this because it is a crazy, crazy world. And I yeah. tell my family all the time, you know, politics is, is a tough business to get into and you want to have the most support. Um, and, you know, I would never want somebody to kind of sign on board in this life if they weren't, um, you know, ready for it. It's also a big time commitment. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's very important for people to, you know, make time for family and make time for a significant other. And it's, you know, I'd want to make sure that I'm giving all of my time to that person and, and my family when I um, have that opportunity. But also recognize that I'm on a journey that is, you know, a lot kind of more challenging and a lot sure. uh, takes a lot of time out of somebody and a lot of energy out yeah. of somebody. And it just wouldn't be fair. It's a mature decision. Somebody knew, you know, kind of and was ready for it. I started to think about something a moment ago and I wanted to circle back to it. So a lot of folks that listen to this don't live in the 14th. Yeah. How can somebody, we've talked about this with other people, I talk about it from time to time. What are some things people can do, tangible, real things yeah. that... Bob in Wisconsin or or Sally in Phoenix can do to affect change in their locale for the things that we're talking about, proliferating freedom, liberty, the, the cause. A big thing is running for local office. I mean, committee men, township captains, mm -hmm. things that um, there's so much more. I would say arguably are more important at a local level that good people aren't even getting involved with. We need more. Um, leaders for the party at a local level. I mean, mm -hmm. you've had experience with the, you know, county board and um, the Republican Party county board, car, county, and making sure that, you know, you can have a voice and yeah. bring new people in. So it's very important to get involved, um, but also volunteering for campaigns, you know, for somebody like myself, but in different states and different areas. You worked with our former governor's campaign, right? Yeah. Governor Rauner. What other... Uh, campaigns have you helped with uh so in where i was in school miami of ohio was in john boehner's district and what school did you go to miami of ohio which one did you go to in ohio drew uh akron, akron. oh okay Never so you weren't that akron. far uh but i was involved with college republicans and okay. different campaigns there and have always just wanted to be involved because we need you know that energy and people to knock doors. I mean, it takes mm -hmm. an army it does. of help. It does. And I think sometimes the volunteers and people don't know just what to do to help. And it's really important to knock doors, make phone calls, spread the word, Facebook, everything. One of the things I like about social media, if somebody not just shares something, but like this podcast. So this podcast, once you guys hear it, it'll be a week or two from now. Uh, her primaries coming up. So even if you don't live here where we're at, you can share it on your Instagram account, your Facebook account, your Twitter account, yeah. and just say, hey, Illinois folks, 
Even if your Illinois friends don't live here, tell them to share it because, and this is the part I think people get so disconnected from, like this is why I'm helping my friend in Texas who's running for yeah. sheriff because that's a big office. And right. he has not sway, but uh, I guess sway is not a bad word. He has sway over a lot of people and people will have him come speak and, and, and engage with broad groups of people. So when you start to look at it, uh, as we're an, uh, as, look at it as if we're an organism, mm -hmm. I'm not telling this to you so much as everybody. And like, I, it's important to me that my foot is as healthy as my elbow. Yeah. And it's as important that my, I don't want a sick ear or a sick eye. And we get so fixated on like, I'm the knee and I'm not the hip right. or whatever, um, that we don't even think about it. But if somebody, I, I want kick ass Congress people in Ohio right. and in Connecticut and, and in Florida and while I can't go there and cast a ballot, I can do everything that's, that I'm capable of. You know, wealthy people might write checks. Right. But somebody that doesn't have that money, it's if, if you could take two minutes to write a compelling paragraph, uh, and not just, that's the other problem, like folks will just share something. Yeah. If you just share like a link, nobody gives a shit about your link. But if you say, hey, do me a really important favor. This link is our friend Catalina, and Catalina is running for Congress, and it's important that we put Catalina in Congress and people like her because our republic is decaying, and she's one of the people that will, will stop it decaying. You know, people need to feel that they have the ability right. to affect some kind of change. And one good person... Uh, creates that domino effect. I mean, there are yeah. so many people now running for office everywhere across the country that are just so, just everyday people that want to stand up and have mm -hmm. a voice. And so, you know, I encourage people to look at who's running in their district, get involved in the primaries. But also, I just had this the other day at an event. Uh, this woman was like, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear about you, but my, you know, aunt, I think it was in Tennessee, knew about you, saw you on Fox News, and was mm -hmm. like, oh, she's running in Illinois, and it turned out I was in that person's district. And so this power of community with social media it is very powerful. Yeah. And I'm so grateful to have so much support, not only in the district, but outside of the district. I mm -hmm. mean, um, $5 from Alaska, yeah. it, that means a lot to Let's me. talk about that for a second. Yeah. I think if people listening and they're like, oh, cool, you got 5 bucks from Alaska, I don't... Most campaigns, and, and you can think about yourself if you're listening, how often have you went on your PayPal account and sent five bucks to a candidate 20 states away? For most of us, the answer is zero. So when, when you are working in a campaign and you see that you've got thousands of dollars, you get this, but when you get thousands of dollars coming in where it's 10 bucks here and 20 bucks there and, and these little denominations, that's really powerful uh, from the, the the standpoint of support, but also what people are feeling. I, I can't do a lot, but I can do something, and I care enough that you know, my lunch money or you know, a quarter of a tank of gas, I'm going to send it. I've received so much, and I'm so grateful and and humbled by the amount of support that I have across the country. Uh, and, you know, whether it's the small dollars, but even the notes that come with it mm -hmm. really fuel. Uh, a lot of what... Would you share a note? Just, you know, paraphrase note? And I wish... I, I had, I think, this woman in... She might have been in the Carolinas somewhere, but said that, you know, I, we just contributed to your campaign and we saw you on uh, Fox News or it might have been a podcast, actually. And she said, I, I shared it with my little girls. And she's like, I wish I could vote for you, but uh, thank you for being uh, an inspiration to them and, and hope for the future. That probably gets your eyes teared up when you read it. Absolutely. Yeah, and it's good stuff. It, and it, I'm so humbled by that. But it's it truly just, it's not about me as the candidate. It's about the feeling that was out there that people didn't feel that there was hope in the millennials or hope in the next generation of, of people in Congress. And, and that means a lot, but it also shows that there needs to be more people like myself. And there are now, like I said, they're running for Congress, uh, but there was a gap that truly needed to be filled across the country. And I'm so confident that that gap, because it's needed across the country, that it's definitely needed here in this district. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wish I could just replicate all of that, that power and that momentum and, and bring it back home here. 
Um, and it has. We've been spreading like wildfire since, you know, I launched. And this momentum has been picking up, especially right before the primary, which is great. Um, You've but got a lot of national press coverage. Yeah. Have some of your opponents gotten the no, same? No, not at all. What do you <laughs> think has got the news networks interested in you versus some of the other candidates? That's got to be a bummer yeah. for them, not you. I it again it's that feeling that we needed an answer to the the forces that be on the other side and from the younger perspective but you know there's a lot of similarities uh, between Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and myself just from a surface perspective I mean we both have Hispanic backgrounds I would replace her as the youngest elected in Congress so there was always that you as would well. be the youngest ever elected yeah, to Congress yeah and well, that's cool but and again not about that but that's just she sure. had that that she had that tail, title tail of the tape right and and so people you know when i first announced really tried said i was a you know conservative answer to aoc and so that really garnered a lot of national media attention and uh but also again there aren't a lot of young people running for congress and that was i think just the new the new person around the sure, block sure, that sure. the media really picked up. And again, I'm so grateful that also my story. I mean, my mom came here legally from Guatemala. My dad's a small business owner. And in a in a time where things, especially race, are so politicized, especially what's happening at our border, um, to have more conservative voices that are pro-immigration reform, that are supporting the president on what he wants to do with the wall uh, is something that I think the conservatives also need as well. And that really garnered a lot of media attention as well. Mm -hmm. Are you German, your father's son? Yeah, my dad's German. German yeah. and, yeah. and Guatemalan? That's yeah. a cool mix. Yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think, you know, the ground that we've covered, people are getting an idea of who you are. Um, folks can send you money. Yeah. Yeah, how do they do it? CatalinaForCongress.com or P.O. Box 43, Woodstock, Illinois, 60098. Pennies. Send pennies. Yeah. One of those, uh, <laughs> one of those, those, those uh, flat rate boxes. Just fill one up with your change. Yeah. Again, what was the email or the uh, uh, web address? CatalinaForCongress.com. You guys take like PayPal and all that on there? Uh, I don't. It's through the secure credit card system. Okay. I don't think okay. PayPal is okay. part of it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. One but, of those types of. Things. Yeah. One of those types of. Things. Yeah. It's no cool. Venmo yet on campaigns. No. No. <laughs> no. That's interesting. Yeah. Final final words. I always ask people this on this podcast. If the people listening or, or viewing never cross your way in life, and this is the only time they ever see you, what would you pass on to them? I, just, you know, words of wisdom coming from somebody that's doing uh, something very hard is just never back down in anything that you believe in, whether it's politics or business. Um, never give up because you can be the change and and I hope that you know people will continue to fight for what they believe in and to not let insecurity or whatever fears that they have from not only doing what they love but also making the change that they can I, I really uh, I like that never back down we've had a lot of a lot of guests that are successful in various endeavors um, and while you haven't won yet, it is success that you've gotten to this point. Thanks. Uh, and it's a common thread. Nobody, nobody ever achieves much of anything if they stop once it gets hard. So I appreciate that. Most of these podcasts are recorded remotely. The people that come here, we have them sign that. Oh. So one day in the future, we'll be like, oh man, that female president oh, no. was here one time so Very cool. wherever Where you want go? wherever you right want in the middle wherever you want I'll that says right a lot in this little corner <laughs> oh is that what you, you feel like you're a little corner person? <laughs> yeah, just for now no wherever you want to, yeah wherever you want why don't we make room for other people in here no i'll go right here all right i feel a little Ooh, that's a fancy fancy there we go put the date underneath it it's the 14th okay. valentine's day 2 oh. 14 20. Time to go home to my dog. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, I hope that you guys enjoyed the discussion. I appreciate that she took yeah. the time to... Thanks for listening. ...come over. Yeah, for sure. I, 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 m the reason I wanted you to come do this, one, to help get some exposure, yeah. but so often you guys say to me, like, what am I supposed to do? Well, there you go. Uh, <laughs> go do something. Help me. Yeah, yeah. You can ha help... 
but also that's it's a framework, right? Yeah. You know, he and I have run campaigns. You've worked on campaigns and probably run them. There's a very simple framework. There is. You know, it's just like selling anything. You're the product. The voter's the the uh, customer. Yep. You need money to create the marketing campaign, and you put it you put it together. And so, either you're the candidate or you're helping the candidate, one or the other. And find people like her that that believe as you do and, and help them and then the cool thing is if she doesn't do what she says she's going to do then you, you come just back to this. yeah you just yeah. go right back right and you vote yeah. them right out it's yeah. and that's just it that is how it's supposed to work jesse ventura when you know you know when he went in, into the governor's job up in minnesota yeah. he did like he did exactly that and i'm not like you know i don't i don't even know what his his tenure there looked like but he said i'm going to be here for a term and leave because that's like what this job's supposed to be yeah. and he did it you know people they wanted him to stay yeah but um that's what has to be done and i think the 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 cycle will continue and mm -hmm. we've just got to make it so accountability yeah well that's what i'm talking <laughs> about we have to pay attention to be hold, held accountable to pay attention. too often we expect we the people expect that those we elect should carry the burden and they're just carrying part of it. Like government, I always saw it as like four parts, not the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. I saw us of course. as the fourth, you know, like that's how my brain always imagined it. Like these three work for me. Like we're like the big foundation underneath it. And yeah. I think too often we separate ourselves from that. It's always they, 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 instead of, like, even when you're a congressperson, yeah. no offense, you're no greater than I. No. You're afforded no more <laughs> protection or benefit under the law. No. Our president, his voice, while he has a bigger pulpit, he is afforded no more uh, protection under the law than the, any other citizen. Of course, it's not really how it always works, but that is the way the law is. Well, and a big part of that, too, is, you know, these representatives that just go to Washington and they stay there for a long time and they sit in this ivory tower without, you know, I was just talk talking to my parents about this, that, you know, I'm, I love Woodstock. I love that I was born and raised here. I yeah. love that I can, you know, go to the dive bar and have a beer and with I my not, friends. I do not like dive bars. Why not? No, I'm just kidding. You should. But... That's how, again, you know, you shouldn't just be processed through the system and then, you know, somehow you sit on this perch. And that, I bet many of them out. didn't start that way. No. Well. That's, and that, and that's self-inflicted when you allow yourself to de-evolve into the thing you didn't want to be. That's on you. Yeah. That takes the ability to self-reflect some. It does. And that happens. Like, you, you hear rock stars and such. Next thing you know, I found myself... You know, drinking and doing drugs, and yeah. and that's not what I wanted to become. And they get away from their art. Mm -hmm. That's this is your art, and if you allow the lifestyle and the the glam and all of that to put you into that headspace, that's on you. Absolutely. Yeah. But you should be so firm in who you are that going into that, you're not going to be absorbed. And I processed hope that you shall. I what hope that you shall. Oh, well. I, we, uh, <laughs> not, I'm not, you can come call I'm not me saying. <laughs> I'm not saying I don't think you will. I'm saying yeah. I, mean, I won't be there. I hope that you will. I hope that I barely know you. I hope that you will um, be able to do that. Yeah. So, guys, well. hey, before we go, uh, super simple thing you can do. So we proliferate and, and promote liberty by engaging in it. So pass this podcast on. Uh, if you're listening to this a year from now, it's 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 uh, Valentine's Day 2020. But if you're listening <laughs> to this in the next few months, pass it on and, and and type something. Hey, don't just share a link. Say, hey, check this out. It's a young woman trying to do her part to to promote liberty. Watch it, view it, and if you've got young girls, daughters, granddaughters, nieces, and it's not just a sexist thing, but young men too. <laughs> uh, I'm serious though. <laughs> you know, have them watch it. And then go to her campaign. She said five or ten bucks, but I know some of you, because you can afford our classes, can can pony up five hundred or more. Why not? And and then the max contribution is twenty eight hundred. So. Okay, so twenty eight hundred. So the max contribution for a individual. Individual. Yeah. Couples fifty six hundred. And then um we can talk about some other stuff in private. Okay. Not you, them, me. Oh. Me okay. and you. Yeah. 
things like <laughs> packs and things of that nature. But that do it. P pass it on and then go vote. Literally, if you call, there's a every one of your communities has somebody in it that knows what's up. Find them. Go to your 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 uh, uh, if you're clerk uh, court. Well, I was going to say like the Republican or Tea Party or Libertarian chairman or whatever. If you're re if you're a Democrat, go there and find out who's running and and call them on the phone. I guarantee if you've got somebody running and you want to call or if you want to talk to them. If they really want to get elected, at the very least, they will send you an email and you can say, hey, here's kind of what, what's weighing on me. Would you agree? Yeah. 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 I mean, maybe, maybe not by the time that the person's uh, in your position. You don't have the time to take every call, but you can find out uh, about the person and then just go vote and tell, tell your friends to go vote. And that's really simple. That's how you win campaigns. And by winning campaigns with people that matter, mm -hmm. you start to affect change on a meaningful level. Absolutely. Yeah, even and you know what people do that even when they don't like the change. That's what Barack Obama did. That's what any big politician does. They affect change. Change is not always great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not. So that's all I got. This is another episode of the Higher Line podcast. Thank you Catalina Thank for coming you. out and, and visiting and I hope that you guys uh, take an active role in your community and in the nation as a whole because we are an organism that if one part of us starts rotting away, uh, you either cut it off or it infects the whole system and you die. So take your vitamins. <laughs> Visit our website, carrytrainer.com, for information about classes held throughout the U.S., Carry Trainer Apparel, and upcoming projects. You can also email us at training at carrytrainer.com for information about setting up your own private course or speaking engagement. Training at carrytrainer.com or carrytrainer.com.